when I enlisted in the Air Force, in my mind, I thought, I'll be trained with skill. And in my head, I thought, maybe like a data processing, you know, because I was living in Silicon Valley at the time. And that was the going thing in the early 60s. Sure. The IBM, Memorex, and all those startup companies were going strong with data processing and storage and all that stuff. So that was kind of my thought that was what I wanted to do. Well, in basic training, during the seven to eight weeks that you're in basic, you're taken to this testing room and they give you a battery of uh, tests, you know, to determine your, your ability to function and learn. As, after they got the results, I got called in and there was this uh, staff sergeant. He goes, uh, Airman, Airman, your tests indicate you have an aptitude for language. Do you know any foreign languages? I said, yeah, I studied uh, German in high school for three years because I lived in Munich, Germany. He goes, how fluent are you? I said, well, I haven't used it in you know, a couple of years. We got back in 63, this was 67. I said, well, I'm like anybody else. If you don't use it, you, you lose it. He goes, okay, well, so then he set the hook. He goes, if you sign up for language school, most likely you'll go back to California to the Presidio of Monterey. I see you you came from San Jose. That's that's a couple that's less than an hour and a half. You could be home every weekend. And he goes, and then if you put German as your language of choice, you'll probably get it and you can challenge it and you'll spend the rest of your service life, service time somewhere in Germany using the German language. That was a gotcha, right? So I said, okay. I signed the dream sheet, you know, and uh, once I signed, I waited for orders for language school. Well, when I got the orders, I got Korean. Mm -hmm. So I went back to that admin sergeant and I said, I thought, he goes, well, he goes, that's what you wanted, but the Air Force already figures you already know how to speak German. We're going to teach you how to speak Korean. So that moment, in the middle of basic training, I knew my remaining service time was going to be spent in the Far East. So let's let's uh, fast forward then to um, language school. I mean, is sure. it when you're learning Korean? Then was it pretty much immersion from from day one? How did how did that process yes. go? Yeah, they. Uh, it was just like kindergarten in, in, in you know teaching one two three A B C. I mean it was total immersion where we were discouraged from speaking English. So they taught us basic uh, conversational Korean, and I don't think it had a north south uh, differentiation. It was just basic Korean. Oh, okay, so they didn't and, focus uh, on a North Korean accent or North Korean vocabulary or anything like that. Yeah, because. Because our instructors were predominantly from North Korea. Mr. Kim, he was from somewhere, not Pyongyang, but he was, he, he told us his background. And there was a husband, wife team, the leads. Then we had the head of the department, his name was Cho. And then we had about three or four others that would come in and teach, besides the, uh, you know, alphabet, numbers, Chinese characters. Some were teaching us the culture, traditions. One guy taught us songs. Mm -hmm. You know, the other guy introduced us to a, a Korean cuisine. You know, so we got a pretty wide exposure to not just the Korean language, but the Korean people and the culture. And so, but Mr. Kim was our primary. He was like the guy we went to the first class in the morning, and then the last class in the afternoon, and we. If I, I think it was uh, six hours a day. I remember getting into class at 8.30, and then we'd have like three hours to 11.30, and then we'd have lunch for 30 minutes, and then 12 to three, we were back in the barracks. 37 weeks, six hours a day, five days a week. And when you're 
at lunch or and then after hours are there people monitoring you are there you know enlisteds monitor monitoring you to make sure you're not communicating with others in english do they really want everything to be oh, oh. in korean as much as possible no no because once once we're out of the classroom then we could we could you know we are supposed to be studying after you know after hours uh, but like it was just only in the classroom because they wanted to feed so much of like I think we had to learn 150 Chinese characters. And the Chinese characters are intermixed with the Korean characters. But the Chinese character for a symbol for man could be the symbol for gold in Korean. And so there was a, so you could be reading a text in Korean and then there'd be a Chinese character thrown in there. So you had to kind of identify with what that stood for because maybe it was like a not an acronym but instead of spelling k-i-m which could be their name was also the name for gold they could just put this chinese character in there and oh, use that with kim yeah you know so but you know we didn't learn i mean there's thousands of chinese characters but they just figured we need to have a basic reading comprehension and, and then also writing it we spent an hour in the afternoon practicing on the blackboard with a teacher. As the course goes on and you get past mm -hmm. the basics, right? Is the is the Korean that you're learning now is it is it increasingly job specific? Um, so well, they know what kind of jobs you're going to be doing, and so working on that kind of vocabulary. Yeah, well, we went from once we got the reading and writing and comprehending what we were and speaking it. We had one, we had several books that were in Korean, but they talked about the beginning of the Korean War. You know, certain words would stick in your mind, like there's a word for barbed wire, you know, you know, uh, you know stuff like that. And, and so we're reading military history about the Korean War. And that's where I had forgotten that they, they had never quit a war it was a truce you know they just it was a cessation of hostility sure. yeah. so now we got there in september of 67 the pueblo was seized in 68 we're in class and we're seeing the news accounts of this seizure and capture of the uh, naval personnel on board that that vessel Pueblo is captured, then you're in right. school, and you know then that what the Pueblo is, one of its primary missions is to intercept Korean language uh, transmission. Right. Naval, it was naval intelligence, you know, well, probably everything, everything they could pick up, you know, everything line of sight with uh, most radio. Our teachers focused, uh, focused and you know, attention was for us to just become fluent conversationally. So we developed the ear. Uh, I never used the Korean handwriting in my duties as a air, as a intercept, you know, specialist, because the, they trained us to listen to, uh, say, a radio communication. Now I'm listening to a North Korean Air Force, say, fighter, and they don't speak in like what we call. Uh, it's not conversation. Open, open, open Korean. They spoke in code. Oh, okay. So they would say a word, and if you understood that word as a code word, you could kind of determine what kind of exercise they were doing. And then there was other words that instead of saying we're going, let's return the base. They went, they had a cover term for that. Like at the time, it was more on board. When you heard that, you knew they were going back to land. And then they never said, you know, once on tower, they just said, landing on runway such and such, they throw a number out there, but the run, the, the, the cover term for runway was railroad job. You know, it would translate as railroad track. So if you heard railroad track two seven, 
You just look on your little map and you go, okay, that has to be one son. That's the second fighter division. I mean, the intelligence over there was incredible. You could, when, when you flew enough up or listened enough up there, you started recognizing voices. Really? And our intelligence gathering was so good, they had names to some of those voices. Names and ranks. Oh, really? Actual? Wow. That's, that is. Incredible. Yeah. So our, our job was monitoring North Korean Air Force communications and up, updating the what they call air order of battle. Because like any country, they would move squadrons or flights from one base to another so they could practice uh, air to ground attack or air to air combat maneuvering or, you know, I mean, I used to listen to the, the when, you know, when I was on the morning shift, because it was around 24 hour coverage in the C-130, there was an airplane up there, eight hours droning along the patrol corridor and you would get relieved. You know, that's why they were 10 hour missions. It would take an hour to get to the patrol area and altitude. And then one ship would leave the orbit area and the other one would take over. And then you'd go back and forth for eight hours and then it'd be another hour back to the target. And so, and then we, we flew in different areas too. We flew, the primary one was just across the north, the, the South Korean Peninsula about 40, 45 miles south of the DMV. You were kind of in the safe zone. That, that mission didn't get quote combat pay or hostile fire pay. The T-29 was below 10,000 feet, less than two miles from the DMV. They could get you there. So we got not only flight pay, but hostile fire pay or combat pay. Combat pay. We had a, a track that would get, take us all the way up to Vladivostok from Osan. So, or from Yokota. Sometimes we'd launch out of Yokota and recover at Osan and vice versa. But some flights we had Russian, Korean, and Chinese linguists on board. And when you were flying by your target, target country, you would sit the position. And then as we moved on and the signals faded away, maybe the Chinese guys would come in. Just walk us through a mission. Let's say you're you're doing a mission now right on the DMZ. Um, okay. Walk us through that that mission. Um, you know, sort of, you know, just to summarize briefly, beginning to sure. end, what you would do in a mission along the DMZ. Are you sort of going back and forth? You cross the DMZ, turn around, go back again, and is that how? Yeah, you you, you had to stay south. You couldn't violate Korean airspace. Couldn't violate the DMZ airspace. And so, first of all, the T-29, that was my first assigned air crew airplane. There was two Korean linguists, two Morse intercept operators, an analyst, an airborne mission supervisor. And then in the back of the airplane, separate from us, was a photography unit. So they had this big, beautiful camera back there, the oblique camera and side, you know, they're taking pictures as we're flying along because they're trying to get partner, you know, physical, visual intelligence of changes along the DMZ or possible, what, infiltration groups. The Morse Intercept guys were listening to what they call, you know, a certain, type of transmitter, not a, not a telegraph key. The lack of a better term, the way it was explained to me was, they called it a scratch key transmitter. They had a, like a plastic box that had wires attached to it with grids. And, and, they, and they had this like a, a metal pin or stylus that was also wired. And as they ran, ran this thing up and down this grid, that would be transmitting the position. So if the Morse guys picked that up, on would go the recorders, the magic equipment, and everyone would start triangulating the signals. My job was listening to the, I guess like the walkie-talkie type backpack transmit. If I heard those things up, I turned my recorders on and said, I got a, I've got a signal here on this frequency and they would turn the direction finding equipment on. 
And if they got three clean shots and declared it a, a valid fix, then they would just look, look at the map, get the lat long, that information, the analyst would transmit that to our, our bank, you know, our operation. Those analysts would look at it and they transmit to the, the Air Force, what's on Air Force, no, the AZON. It, it went through several channels and eventually it would get to the 8th U.S. Army in Yangsan and they disseminate the position of the Re Republic of Korea troops. And those guys would go out and beat the bushes looking for those things. No American uh, troops physically confronted infiltrators. That was up to the rocket, the rock defense force. So what you're describing then is you've got North Koreans in the DMZ. You're picking up a, trans, a transmission from them. That information goes through the channels, eventually gets right. to then back to South South Korean troops, who then go into the DMZ. Right. And yeah. Front these when I say rock, ROK, Republic of Korea, that's yeah. that's how we refer to them. So your your missions along the DMZ then had primarily to do with looking after infiltrators, trying to detect infiltrators. Exactly. That, that was all it was. They were sending in by ship across the DMZ on foot and submarines, you know, little little sampans or something, they'd land up on the coast. So I mean, that's why and when I was there in 69, there was a, a curfew between 11 p.m. until I think 6 a.m. in the morning. If you were out caught wandering around, <laughs> you would be treated as an infiltrator. You were bad news. So if you didn't make it to the gate at 11 o'clock, you better find a hotel or a friendly lady of the night to take you in. Sure. They, they, they literally locked the gate. And if you tried to climb over it, they'd treat you like an infiltrator, even though you're, you know, you've got your ID card. And, and if you if you showed up at the gate at 11 one, you better pray that, that they didn't identify you because now you're able or you're violating curfew. So the missions along the DMZ have to do then primarily with intercepting infiltrators or detecting infiltrators, North Korean infiltrators. And then other missions, now what you're doing is capturing transmissions from North Korean planes that are in the air? Yeah, the, when, when my initial training was for the ground site, all we were monitoring was the air communications. We could not hear the ground station. So if a guy was flying around, you know, there, there would be training going on, formation flying. That was humorous. Because the instructor, if he two pilots would almost kill him and he'd be cursing at him in in in, in not in code, but he'd be cursing at him because are you trying to kill me? I said turn right, you know, you know, stuff like that. Or you could just hear you could you could identify by that their transmission. They're doing air to ground gunnery, air to air gunnery, or they're doing formation flying, or weather reconnaissance, or even fish spotting. You know, we started hearing this weird pattern, and and uh, finally they broke down the, the the little single engine, you know, called the ANT Colt, the big old bike plane flying around over the ocean, flying a grid when they discover schools of fish. They get to send the fishing boats out there. This and would be the North Korean pilots would send word that we've got a big school of fish down there. Yeah. And as you're hearing these messages, are you then you're translating them in your mind and then writing them down in English? Yeah, you can transcribe into English, and with the recorder going, when you landed, you didn't just go back to the barracks and start drinking beer. You know, maybe the next day you transcribe your own intercept stuff and try to, you know, because in the, as the airplane's moving along, you're covering, you know, whatever speed that thing is flying. And we're just going from one side of the peninsula to the other, coast to coast. You know, and Korea is not that wide. And and the, the missions on the T-29 were not very long. I think, I think the longest one I was on was about two, two hours. Because you, you were flying low, below 10,000 feet, and you're flying only so many miles south of the DMZ. 
and we had uh, the pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, navigator up front. Then we had us two, four, five, six. We had six what they call security service people, the signals and tell them. Then we had the two photographers in the tail. So it was not a very big crew, but yeah. uh, and then they used visual reference, uh, electronic guidance, and then on board the airplane was a Doppler navigation system. A lot of times we aborted the mission if the Doppler went bad, because that was probably the more precise uh, indicator of your position in reference to the, the line, the DMZ. Oh, I see. So if the Doppler went bad and there was cloud cover below and they weren't sure of their position, they did not want to drift into the North Korea right. or the DMZ so warning area. As you're hearing these messages then, are there some things that are of immediate interest that you pass on immediately and other things that you say, well, okay, I'll transcribe that tomorrow. Are you having to make judgment calls about what needs to be reported now and what can what's more routine and can wait till tomorrow? Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, you know, this is 50 plus years ago. Sure. I think it was more like if we, we heard a hot signal, okay, I've got a live one. Because, you know, they use different radios. They have AM, FM, VHF. I don't think they use UHF on the ground, but, but those backpack transmitters were limited in their uh, range. And it, if we could get a hot fix that showed it was within that, that buffer zone of North Korean DMZ and South Korean DMZ, that's all we wanted. It was all a matter of position fixes. People who go to South Korea now, um, certainly people who go to Seoul these days are going to be struck by how vibrant and wealthy the place is, yes. how, how incredibly clean it is, how vibrant and wealthy it is. Um, what was that area like in, in the late 60s? In 1969, when I got the Osan Air Base, dirty dirt, dirt and dusty dirt in summer and muddy and yucky during the winter. And in the pictures I sent you of thatched roof homes and single story, <clears throat> there may be what, one or two two story buildings in that little village, you know, that it was outside the gate town that you find at most military facilities, uh, uh, major red light district, you know, a lot of you know, clothing manufacturers, shoes. I mean, I could buy a three piece suit over there in 69 for 40 bucks, tailored to me. And the only thing they asked me is when I picked out the material and the style of the suit that I wanted was to go to the base exchange and buy US thread. Because that would stand up in that. Unravel like their own homemade. It was weird. I had shoes made. You know, they take a powder in your foot and you go and pick the style. Well, that a week later, you'd have a new pair of shoes. We went, we, we were invited as a unit at Detachment 169.2nd. We all, we all had house boys. We had like, a, I want to say a 30, 30 man bay, 30 bodies in this wing. Yeah. And you had one houseboy assigned to the wing, and, and uh, the back complex, I think, had four wings. So there's four houseboys taking care of this one structure. And we'd gotten to know our houseboy, and the summer I, I was there, he was going to get married. So he, he and his family invited our, our barracks, not, not the whole four wings, just ours, the 30 guys. To go down there. And once our uh, supervisors and our commander found out about it, you know, remember, you know, there was also a uh, clothing regulation. Couldn't wear Levi's off base. Those had to look nice slacks and a dress shirt, no t shirts, none of that stuff, shorts. 
So when they found out we were invited to this native wedding, that you all will wear coats and ties, diamond shoes, and act in a representing the American you know, people. A civil, you, know, you can't be those rowdy 20 year olds running around terrorizing the village. So we went to his, you know, and of course we all came in armed with beer and whiskey and stuff, and we had a good time. And uh, they were in their native garb. It was a traditional Korean wedding, beautiful. So I, I got a taste of a little bit of the native culture. 